even on tonight. Um, I pray that you would strengthen everyone under the sound of my voice, strengthen every household and every family. Lord, you know what your people need, and we want to be able to provide that. So we thank you for the different gifts in the form of people that you put into your body. Um, we ask that you would just bless her and strengthen her even now, in Jesus' name. So let's receive evangelist Lisa O'Connor with a hearty amen. amen. opportunity. Um, the Lord gave me this mission probably about, I guess about maybe back in 2003 to go and take mental health to all the apostolic churches. Because we know how the apostolic church is. I've been in it for over 50 years and we can be uh, a little apprehensive when it comes to learning new things, uh, we can be a little bit um, slow about moving in the direction that God is trying to push us into. And sometimes he has to push us. Man. He's pushed me a lot, not just a nudge, but he's had to push me. Um, and so I thank God for this opportunity for a pastor in uh, First Lady Acres and to the Green family and to the Acres family and to um, Shantae and her family and Sister Brown and my sisters here, both spiritually and naturally. Of course, I call her my sister as well. And um, just a little bit about me. Of course, I've been in the church for over 50 years, uh, sanctified and Holy Ghost filled, yeah. living the life of with the Lord and happy to do that. Um, highly credentialed um, in the areas that I needed to be credentialed in. But more importantly, here to prayerfully give you a new outlook or a new way of thinking about mental health. Um, mental health, that those two words can be really scary sometimes when we hear those. Uh, but I don't want you to be intimidated by them because basically it is a opportunity where your mind has a tendency to feel like it's separating itself from your body. Amen. We know that the head controls everything. And we know that when God designed this body, he designed it where we, um, he controls everything because he is what? The head of our lives. And so mental health has a tendency to attack our mind. Um, a lot of times, um, People don't understand what's going on with their bodies, why they're acting differently, why they're, um, they're, there's a change, a drastic change, what's causing it, they don't know. Uh, a lot of African-American families, we would never put our relatives in an institution for their mental health. We had a room in our homes and we kept our loved ones in a room. And people go back and say, oh, Miss so-and-so lives there upstairs. And they look upstairs, and sometimes Miss So and So would be in the window, and sometimes the kids would get a kick out of running through and, and town line this, you know, this neighbor up in the window. Uh, it wasn't until probably about maybe 10 years ago that African Americans started saying, you know, we need to do something more than just keep our people in a room. We need to do something that's more healthy for them and to bring them back to where we feel like God can bring them back to. Uh, as adults, our minds are attacked. As children, our minds are attacked. As teenagers, our minds are attacked. Uh, it doesn't matter what your age is, you could be attacked with mental health. And I'm just going to read this for those that can't see it very well. It is a, um, it includes our emotions, our physical and social well-being. It affects how we think, how we feel, and how we act. 
uh, I work at a hospital and I see a lot of people's actions. Um, I see a lot of people coming in and the doctor, medical doctors aren't sure what's going on. So I work in the emergency department, which is mental health, the behavior health section is part of the emergency room. But because there's more than one department that services the ER, we are part of the emergency department, the ED. So when they can't figure out what's wrong with a person, they can't figure out what's, what, you know, what's going on, if the family says, well, this is how they were acting, and now all of a sudden this is going on, then they call us. And so I've always, I always love working in trauma, trying to figure out what's going on. With the Lord's help, he helps us to figure that out. Um, I've always been curious about the mind and how it works, what makes people think the way they do, what makes give them that expression. They might be sitting up very with an odd expression and I'd be like, Mom, what are they what are they thinking about? She said, Honey, I don't know. You know, I said, Oh, why are they looking that way? I don't know, baby. You know, always been curious about that. So in working in the ED, we get to talk to people and find out how they think, how they feel, how they act. It also helps to determine how we handle stress. And stress can be related to others and make and um, allow for healthy choices or unhealthy choices sometimes. Mental health is important at every stage of life from childhood and adolescence through adulthood. Um, there are some common mental health disorders and the reason we call them disorders is because sometimes it takes us out of our comfort zone and it makes us appear to be a, diff a total different person, okay? So some of the more common um, mental health disorders are depression. And depression is a big one because a lot of people have depression or are depressed, but they don't know why. <coughs> they get sad for no reason. They, Mr. Sean is here, praise the Lord. They get sad for no apparent reason. They um, distance themselves from other people. I don't want them to see what I'm going through. I don't want them to see what my expressions are. They uh, tend to um, isolate themselves. And depression, major depressive depression disorder, MDD, it hurts you physically. It not only hurts your mind, but it hurts you physically. And sometimes you might think, I'm just so down, I'm just so uh, out, I just don't feel well, I don't know what's wrong, I've been to the doctor, they can't figure it out. I just feel uh, disconnected from myself, disconnected from my body. Uh, I don't want to be around nobody, I don't want to be anybody around me. And that's when depression is setting in. And depression is a little stinger because it can hit you a little bit at a time. And then all of a sudden, you have to go full blown depression. Um, another um, common mental health disorder is anxiety disorder. That's where everything in your body seems to speed up. You start moving fast, you start talking fast, you, your body starts to feel jittery inside, you start to feel um, like you can't control yourself. It's kind of like you're um, on a treadmill and it's, it's on like maybe number 10 and that's the highest and you're just, just going and going and going and you just can't, you can't sleep, you can't eat, you're just, you're just going. And one of the common anxiety disorders is generalized anxiety disorder and they, they say generalized because they can't specifically say what the anxiety is. So they make it a generalized anxiety disorder, a GAD. The next one is obsessive compulsive disorder. And I know some people that have that, that's in this room. Um, and that's where you do things 100 times. You might go back and you might put a piece of paper there and then the paper looks like it's moved and so you have to straighten it up. When you come back and the paper looks like it's moved again, you got to straighten it up. You may go clean out a closet and you're thinking, oh, I've got to go back and redo that because that's just not right or you know, this is not, this is out of place. And sometimes I'm like that. Sometimes I have OCD, you know? Sometimes I want things to be just so, and when they're not just so, I'm bothered by that, okay? And so that's how 
people with obsessive disorder, OCD. That's how they are. They just have to have, they have to have everything. They're stringent, they're organized, they're, uh, they don't like to step outside their comfort zone. They want things just to line up. And we know that life does not allow that, right? right. Amen. Another uh, common mental health disorder is bipolar disorder, which comes in stages one and two. Um, and one is not more um, worse than the other, it's just that they have different symptoms that go along with it. But if you have bipolar one, it's just as bad if you had it bipolar two. So it's not uh, judged on whether you have one or two, it's judged by your symptoms. And usually people that have bipolar disorder, there's two sides to it. There's what we call a manic side, which is a side that um, takes you out of reality. And so whatever you were doing before that manic episode hit you, that's where you were, get stuck at. We had a patient that came to the hospital and they had been to a concert, a music concert. And all of a sudden, they got locked into a manic state. And the family didn't know what to do, what was going on. The doc, medical doctors didn't know what was going on. So they called me, I went over, and I said, well, this person is manic. So what happened was, we brought her over to our unit, and that person was mimicking the concert that they were just at. So they were playing the guitar, they were singing Rihanna songs, they were talking a mile a minute. They were sweating profusely. They were pacing, you know, they wanted an audience. They were bamming on the door so we could come out of the office and be their audience. You know, they were acting that way. And one thing about a bipolar person when they're manic, you don't try to disturb whatever they're thinking or whatever they're going through at the time because that can make them worse or they can make them lash out and they can hurt somebody. What we usually do is we let them run out of steam and eventually they do get tired and they start to slow down. And once they start to slow down, then the doctor has the medical, or the psychiatrist who we staff with has given us the nurse um, orders to give that person a mild sedative. So when they start running out of steam and they're slowing down and they're not as um, uh, acting like they were prior to, then they can lay down and they usually sleep for several days. A manic person is usually up for several, several days. So they have to catch their rest somehow. And usually when they wake up, whenever that is, then we can talk to them and assess them and find out what happened and what caused it and what's going on and um, get to the bottom of it and prescribe some type of treatment um, method for them and uh, give them some resources and refer them back to um, their primary care physician or we get them connected to a, um, a therapist who can sit down with them and work on what's going on in their life, okay? Another type is post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and that can occur in anybody. Any of these disorders can, can uh, happen to any of us. It can um, occur at any time. There's no time limit. There's no, uh, no specifics that you have to go through in order for these things to happen. They can just sometimes just happen. And post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD usually occurs when there's been a trauma. For instance, if a child has been molested and they, the parents never allowed them to deal with it growing up, so by the time now they're an adolescent or a young adult, and then they're having uh, some problems with um, <coughs> the stress that they went through as a child, so now it's time to deal with that. Okay, And so they go to therapy and they um, begin to work out what the cause was and sometimes that involves, a lot of times that involves going back to where that incident started. It could have been your mom may have spanked you so hard for what you had done because she was trying to chastise you and that may be something that got you stuck 
to where now you're having PTSD about it. And if I was to raise my hand and just to, just to do an expression, they would duck because they think I was getting ready to hit them. Okay, so those are sometimes lasting um, situations that transpire in a person. And the last one that I listed was schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is another one that can kind of sneak up on you because it um, makes you think that everybody's against you. It gives you a phobia. It gives you a, um, a sense of, I don't trust that person. She's bothering me. They're on me. Oh, they're watching me. They're following me. All kinds of things like that occur with schizophrenia. And it kind of sneaks up on you. But my job is to order from the Lord as, as, as well as my training is to find out why you are in this state. What got you here? And how do we move you forward? And that's the ultimate goal is to move you forward. And if you can't hear me, just speak up because sometimes my voice kind of goes. I was really sick last week. The devil was trying to stop me from coming. You know how that is. And so this week I'm trying to get back into my normal routine. But God is good. Yes, Amen. 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 Uh -huh. So now I want to talk about some questions that maybe you have been thinking about or not just yesterday or last night or two weeks ago. Maybe you've been thinking about this. When you think about it, when you hear someone says mental health, maybe you've been thinking about this for a while. And you think, is mental health hereditary? It just because my mom had it, am I going to get it? Or my dad had it, am I going to get it? Or my sister had it, or my aunt, or my uncle, is it going to happen to me? And the definition that some scientists uh, use is that they have recognized that many psychiatric disorders tend to run in families, suggesting that potential genetic roots are the cause of it. Such disorders include autism, ADHD, bipolar disorder, major depression and schizophrenia. So scientists believe that you can inherit these mental health disorders. As a child of God, God is perfect. And he made this body and he knows all about this body. And I don't believe that God would have given you any of these disorders on purpose. However, I think that these disorders can be developed over a period of time by certain things that we do or certain things that we say, okay? The second question is, can mental health be passed down genetically? And it says mental health disorders are the result of both genetic and environmental factors. There is no single genetic switch <coughs> and flip causes mental health mental disorder. Consequently, it is difficult for doctors to determine a person's risk of inheriting a mental disorder or passing the disorder to their children. Again, these are what the doctors are saying. These are what the scientists are saying. These are what the researchers are saying. But I say, again, God made a perfect person when he made us, but these can be developed over time. Um, and there may be some people that believe what the doctors say, and I'm not saying the doctors are not telling the truth or their, their research didn't find them, um, find some type of um, reason for them to believe what they believe. I'm just saying what I believe mm -hmm. as an individual, as a child of God that's been with the Lord over 50 some years. Because sometimes I think, oh Lord, I'm, I'm so, what am I today? I wake up, I don't know what I am, mm -hmm. but I do know that I'm a child of God. So there's the five warning signs of mental illness, and they are as follows. Excessive paranoia, worry, or anxiety. Have you ever gotten to the point to where you feel like everything that transpires or everything that happens you worried about? You can be honest with me. I worry about things, well, I don't worry because I pray, but I am concerned about things may not that may not happen when I think they should happen. And sometimes I get a little impatient and want instant this or instant that. And you know, sometimes even when you make instant rice, it doesn't always turn out. Right. Sometimes I get make instant rice and it's real gummy and sticks together and it's just 
I can't eat. So, have any one of you experienced excessive worry? Yes. That's, I mean, that's part of our norm, living in the 20th century. That's part of our norm. We do worry about some things. We do get anxious about things, right? Okay. Long-lasting sadness or irritability. Have you ever just went through the whole day and was just sad and wasn't sure why you were sad? Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. I'll do that sometimes. Even me. Uh, extreme changes in moods. You know, you could be one way this morning, and probably two hours later, you just don't want to be touched, don't want nobody bothering you, you just want to, you know, stay in your, in your little confined area and be left alone, right? You can say yes. I promise you, nobody's gonna, gonna bother you to say yes. I'll, I'll protect you with my prayers. You it withdraw socially. You don't want to go anywhere. You don't want to do anything. You don't want to uh, have anybody close to you. Oh, I hope she doesn't. So and so is in town and want as a concert, and I just hope she don't call and ask me to go because I'm gonna feel obligated to go. But I really don't want to go because I don't want to be out there in the public experiencing anything with anybody. Sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. I like to be at home. I love my home. God bless me with that home. I like to be home, not because I'm worshiping the home, but because there's peace. I don't have to deal with nobody. You know, I can pray, I can walk through the house, I can pray, I can talk to my mom, I can, you know, get on the phone and call somebody when I get to the point I'm lonely. But for the most part, I just like to be home. And then dramatic changes in eating or sleeping patterns. And I'm gonna ask you to really watch this in yourselves. Because when you start to changing your eating habits, and you know, as African American sanctified folk, we love to eat. Because so I was sick last week, but I was thinking about fried chicken all over here. And I know my stomach's going to be ready for that. I've been thinking about it. Uh, but the Lord helped me to turn over a new way of eating, so now I eat healthy, but I do eat a piece of fried chicken every now and then. And it's not going to hurt anything. It's only eat it every day, like I used to. Uh, so when, you're, when your eating habits start to change, and for me, I don't miss too many meals. I'm like my grandmother. Even when she would get sick, she could still eat. We never understood that, but she could still eat. But now when I get sick sometimes, I crave something, and I'll, I, go, I get it. Then I'm like, oh, I should probably shouldn't have ate that. Because, just because she did it, you know, I can't do it. Uh, and then when your sleep pattern, you, you stay up all night, you can't go to sleep, you have a problem with, and then you try to sleep at your desk, and sometimes, Lord knows, I'm, I'm getting ready to confess. Sometimes I sit at my desk and I, my head might drop, and I'm like, oh, did I just go to sleep? No, I'm good and well, I did. <laughs> you know, I lost, what, two or three minutes of time, I went to sleep. Not because I didn't sleep, um, at home, I didn't sleep long enough. Right. But the Lord has blessed me to where as soon as my head gets the pillow, I'm out. I don't have to wait. I, mm -mm. Last night when I came home from work, I have a little routine, I'm sure we all do, to get ready for the next day. And one of the things I do when I hit my bedroom is I turn my TV on. Well, last night, yesterday evening, about quarter to eight, I turned the TV on, and uh, Television came on, and all of a sudden the picture left. I was like, oh my goodness, there's no picture. There was sound, there was no picture. So I turned the television off and I turned it back on, same thing. And all of a sudden the picture left. I'm like, oh Jesus. Then I got to thinking, how long have I had this television before I even moved here? I think I had it before I moved in my first house. Now this is my second house, or maybe my third. And I still have it, so maybe it's about time for it to start going out, you know? So my sister called, she's always checking on me to see, one of my sisters always checking on me to see if everything's okay. She said, what you doing? So I told her about the television. She said, what you gonna do? I said, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm going to prepare like I always do, make my ice water, put it on the nightstand, and do what I gotta do in the bathroom, then come back, get in the bed, Tell Alexa to turn the TV on Netflix, find Sister Sister, because it's a family show, 
And I can listen to that all night. And it'll put me to sleep. And when I wake up in the morning, if it's still running, it'll be okay. I didn't watch anything. I didn't listen to anything horror. I didn't listen to anything that was, because it kept me up all night. But I had my prayer. I talked to Alexa. And I have Alexa on my TV and in the kitchen. So I have to be careful. I talk softly in the bedroom <laughs> because if I don't, in the kitchen, she'll say, I'm sorry, but I can't find that or whatever. I'm like, nobody asked you to find anything? <laughs> but I had to remember, so I talk softly into the remote. Right. So they found uh, Sister Sister. So I laid down, covered all the way up to my neck, <laughs> turned her over on my left side. A few minutes, I was out like a light. Right. Woke up this morning, had a great rest, yes. and sound still is going. It's still going, because sometimes I forget to set the timer on my television, so it goes all night. Yes. And it's okay, because I'm, I'm it's just me, and I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. And of course, last night, I couldn't set the timer because it wasn't working right. So, you know, it had to play. So we did that and got up this morning, started making calls and sending out emails and things like that. So I got somebody coming tomorrow because my son's out of town for a couple of weeks. And, but he did come by to check on his mom. He said, I just wanted to look up on you because you've been sick. And I just had to look up on you and make sure you were okay. But he didn't have time to do what I needed him to do with the television. And that was okay because I wanted to see him too. Uh, so he hugged me, he kissed me, and he was out the door. So I told him, I said, you know, prayers are with you, blah, blah, blah be safe, things like that. But we got somebody coming tomorrow that I'm praying on because they asked me a whole bunch of questions because my television's on my, uh, mounted in the home. So he was asking me, because all you have to do is take the television into my bedroom off the mount, take it to the television in the, in the dining room, take that one off the mount, take that one and put it in the bedroom, put it back on the mount, and vice versa, oh, that's the salt, that's it. But he was asking me all kinds of questions. Well, there's furniture involved. Well, you have to move televisions. That's the only furniture, you know, because the chairs are at the dining room table, so you don't have to move that. And I have a chair in my room, but I don't move that. It's light, I can move that. But so y'all pray with me about him now. <laughs> He's my neighbor's handyman. Uh -huh. And we have a singles handy, we have a singles, neighbor um, text thing where we take care of each other. Right. So send out a text to my girls and they, that's what the results were. So pray for me with him if he knows what he's doing because he's not going to put one screw and take anything down if I feel like this is not going to work. Because yes. <laughs> if I don't need him to mess anything up worse, right? Yes. I, can go, I can sleep with sound be okay. I would like to see some pictures. But anyway, so when things start interrupting your sleep patterns, when I start staying up too late at night, or I'm waking up in the middle of the night, and I'm not sure why, or I'm not eating what I normally would eat, or I'm not craving something, or my eating habit has changed, something is not right. And so I need to talk to somebody, right? Is food a contributing factor to mental health? Well, let's find out. And I can get a little bit closer because these are new glasses and you know how you do the no mind, not focus. So, yeah. so what we eat just doesn't affect our physical health. It can also affect our mental health and well-being. Eating well, which means having a balanced diet full of vegetables and nutrients, can improve your sense of well-being and your mood. Scientists have found links between lower levels of certain nutrients such as folic, foliac, foliac, magnesium, iron, zinc, and vitamins B6, B12, and D can worsen one's moods and give them feelings of anxiety and run a risk of depression. And I know that the vitamin D, I've always had a, a vitamin D deficiency even when I was here in the sun, and I had to take um, calcium tablets and vitamin D tablets and all that, and I'm still doing vitamin D. And it's helping. And so that was a deficiency that I had, but now that that's been addressed, and it's been addressed for many years, I can see that that is really helping me as part of my regimen. 
But if we don't include these things that would normally our bodies would produce, then it could cause us to have some problems with our mental health. Because our diet is off, our body's thrown off, we're getting headaches and keeping headaches for lengths of time, days at a time. We're getting, uh, gaining too much weight, losing too much weight. Things in our bodies are just going haywire. So food does have a tendency to affect our mental health, okay? Additional contri contributing factors to mental health disorders. Like I was saying earlier, childhood abuse, trauma, and neglect is one of the big ones that we see a lot at work. A child comes in, the parents there, they're afraid, they're not gonna talk. So I gently ask the parent if it's okay if I talk to their child without them in the room. Sometimes they have a big problem with it, but I have to, I have to, to be able to help this child so that if the child needs to have help beyond going back home with their mom, I need to be able to get to the bottom of that and find that out, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the time, the parents will say, sure, no problem, if they don't have anything to hide. Mm -hmm. The only ones that really kick up a sweat is the ones that know they're not doing right by their child. Oh. And so they have a problem with um, me talking to the child or one of my colleagues talking to the child by ourselves. Then I have to ask the child, is it okay for me to tell your mom this, but there are some things I may need to tell her to help you. So I can't say that I'm gonna keep everything a secret, but this is what I will say. And so that still keeps the child in a relaxed mode to where they can trust me. Right. And I'm still gonna be able to talk to the mom and say, well, these are things that so-and-so and I talked about that they're okay with me talking to you about. Is that okay with you? And they'll say, sure, you know, not a problem. So, but usually when a child has trouble with a mental health disorder, it's because of, for one of those reasons. Social isolation or loneliness, we talked about that. Of course, that has a lot to do with um, your mental health because if you isolate yourself, you don't want to be bothered with anybody, you feel like you can make it in this world by yourself, how many feel like they can make it in this world by themselves? Wonderful, great, great. I talked to one group and everybody seemed like they raised their hand. But yes, you're right. No one can make it in this world by ourselves. Because my sister, this way, she makes me laugh. And I need that sometimes. Right. I've had a day and I have to be brief, we have to debrief before we leave work, which is which means we have to talk about our day and get some kind of closure before we leave the building so we won't take that with us mm -hmm. and cause us to have that problem. Right. But some days I just need her to make me laugh. Right. And she knows how to make me laugh until tears start rolling down my face, and you know, that's a good laugh. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, but but a lot of people say I I don't need nobody. Well, I don't want to be a part of that group because at some point in time, you need somebody. I could go to dinner by myself, but I'd rather go to dinner with somebody and have a conversation. Yeah. All right? I can, you know, go to the mall by myself, but I'd rather have somebody with me and say, girl, how do you think this looks? Right. Is this too tight? Is this too short? What you think? Yeah. Okay? So when you start to isolate yourself and start to be withdrawn, that can be part of what's contributing to your mental health. Okay? Experiencing discrimination and stigma. We've all had bouts of discrimination happen to us over the years, right? Is there anyone in here that's never experienced any discrimination at all? Whether it was race, color, um, somebody want to play with you because you know you were light skinned and they were dark skinned and they thought you were cute, you had long hair, they had short hair, any of that? I remember when I was 14 years old, I had my third spout with discrimination. And I was so hurt that I came home and I cried. I told my mom, I said, I don't understand what happened. You know, I thought that we were okay and I was getting along with everybody. And then someone stood up and said, oh, Connor, you need to dismiss yourself because you're not welcome here. And we don't want to be bothered with you. We're not playing with you anymore. And so you need to leave. 
said, I ain't going nowhere. But then it hit me that they were serious, you know, and these were people that were in my race, a couple of, you know, non-African Americans, but for the most part there were. And my mom sat down with me and she said, this is your experience in your first bout of discrimination. And it's not gonna get any better because the type of world we live in, I can't protect you from it, but I can teach you how to deal with it. And she did, and she took the time. And so when my son came along, I took the time and sat down with him and said, this is what you're dealing with. We're gonna have some prayer, and we're gonna pray for them very people. And when you go tomorrow, this things are gonna change. And he come back and said, Mom, you know what? It wasn't even like that today. Mm -hmm. I said, we're gonna praise God for that, right? Amen. Yeah, so discrimination is something that can help hinder our mental health. Bereavement, losing someone close to you. And that's a big one for me, because I lost my mom back in 97. And, you know, dads are great. I loved my dad, I was a daddy's girl. He went off the scene, he passed away. But there's something about your mom, right? Something about your mom. When you lose your mom, it's like, wow. You know, this, this is big. This is huge. And so bereavement, and I always tell people, uh, grieve the way you need to grieve. Don't let nobody rush you through it. Don't let nobody say you have a time limit and after that you, no. You grieve as long as you want to grieve. You, you, you know, because you had a loss. That was a significant loss. When you have a divorce, that's a significant loss. Because you didn't get married to get divorced, right? You didn't get married for your spouse to cheat on you or, or move in another direction and leave you behind, right? Right. You got married to stay married. Okay? So bereavement comes in different forms. It's not just a death, but it's a separation from someone that you have loved and have put a lot of you into, then all of a sudden things change. So that is a contributing factor. Severe or long-term stress, having a long-term physical health condition, unemployment or losing your job. How many's been there? How many's been unemployed? How many lost their job for no reason? How many lost their job because they said, oh, the funding's been cut, so we gotta cut you? knowing they were lying because when I got cut and called back and talked to some girls there they said well, you know they just hired so and so and so and so right what the foolishness <laughs> but once I let God talk to me he let me realize made me realize it was your time there was up and this is the only way I could get you out of there was to be cut so I was like Okay, Lord, but could you have given me a warning so I could have stepped up a little bit more here and a little bit more there and done this and that? I guess God said, girl, please. <laughs> you know, please. But those are, these are signs that these are things that contribute to your mental health, having a mental health disorder. Not because you're born with it, not because the scientists say you have it, but because things change as life progresses. Right. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. yeah, and so that has a tendency to um, cause us to have those contributing factors. Is it true that saints who deal with this mental health was or is out of the will of God or is not allowing God to help them? And again, you know how I feel about that. I feel like if you go to the doctor and the doctor says this is what you have, then okay, you accept that, that's fine. But if you don't feel like God can help you to get through that, then that's a problem, right? right? Because what can God do? Anything but fail, right? So if you go to him and with the sincereness of heart, he can help you, okay? Look at me. He has helped me. Amen. Years, years, years passed after my mom died. I didn't think I would be standing up here able to talk to you guys about this. Because I was, I was in a situation. 
but I let God help me. Okay, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So these are just some scriptures that says, you have not because you ask not. If you didn't ask God to help you and bring you out of these situations, how will you ever know that he could? Okay? So you have not because you asked not. You didn't go to him and say, Lord, I'm going through this mental health disorder and this is what my doctor's saying, but I don't believe it or I know that you can help me or I know you can do this or that. You didn't do that. So you didn't ask him. You didn't consult him. You just took, took it at face value and went with it. It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. How? Through prayer. Right? And I love prayer because it can be a widespread situation, or it could be just me talking to God. Okay? So it could be intimate, or it could be open. Depends on who I want to know what's going on with me. And sometimes I don't want nobody to know what's going on with me. I just need him to talk to him about it because they can't fix it no way. Right? They might talk about you, kind of sort of on the side, if they're not really a true friend, you know. And you can ask God for true friends because my sister and I, I think we pray for just about everything. So you can ask God, Lord, if he's a true friend, if it's not a true friend, move them out of my life. I don't have time to waste. I don't have time for all that foolishness. That's my word, foolishness. I don't have time for foolishness. Okay? And then the scripture says, The righteous cry, and the Lord hear it, and he delivered them out of all their trouble. So there's three things right there that's proof that God can help us with our situation when it comes to mental health. Right? Does anyone have any questions so far? Pastor Akers, I see that thing right there. I, you know, but uh, <laughs> I just want to say this is good. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just saying this is good. Oh, okay. Um, even exactly what you're talking about now, because, you know, as a person of faith, just even like you said earlier, uh, you may go to the doctor and they may tell you, you know, something may be going on. They might be able to pull up the chart and show you mm -hmm. what's going on. Right. Um, sometimes early on, you know, I, I I can remember having that struggle. Lord, am I letting you down if I take this medicine? Because I may hear one of the older saints that I admire mm -hmm. say they've never taken a pill even for a cold. Right. Um, and I remember I was going through this, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't taking my medicine. And another one, uh, one of my brothers in the Lord had uh, been diagnosed with the same thing um, years prior. And I remember him calling me one time uh, once he figured out what I was what, what was going on with me. And I believe he heard me make a statement about how I don't want to take this medicine. And he had revealed to me that he was basically about to lose his foot because uh, him being a man of faith when he was younger in the Lord and he got diagnosed, he did the same thing. He had the medicine but was like, I'm not taking it. He just didn't take it serious for years. Yeah. Uh, and that his testimony was what helped me to snap out of it and say, okay, right. hey, all right, all right. it looked like I better do the right thing. Yes. But uh, another thing that helped me through their testimony that I had to take medicine, they said they didn't take their medicine unless they prayed over it. They would pray, Lord, don't let this thing have uh, uh, adverse side effects, Lord. I'm putting my faith in you. I'm taking this because I look like I got to take it, but Lord, I trust you. Yes. You know, and, I, and that's what I started doing for myself. Mm -hmm. And that helped me as a younger saint until I began to grow in the Lord and get a little understanding about it, I didn't feel guilty about using the very things that God left behind in this right. earth to heal. Yeah. You know, it's healing in plants and so on and so forth. So it's not outside of the plan of God to be able to, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, yeah. Use the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of the tools that he left, gave humanity to make my life better. But I had to deal with that conflict. And I think a lot of children of God deal with that conflict. Yes. And sometimes if they lose that battle, uh, then it has an adverse effect later on in their life. Amen. Don't you just love him? Mm -hmm. Don't you just love him? Just love Pastor Aker. He's just a wonderful man. 
I love it. Now, not romantically. Not <laughs> 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 straight. Don't make no man. But I just love it because he's a good man. He's a real, true, good man of God. Amen. 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 See, there, young people love you. So, um, all right. But I will, I will address that a little later. But I'm glad you brought that up. Very good. Very good. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I have a question. You know, like, I heard before, like, for schizophrenia, like, a certain age, you get, I can't even remember the age, like, when you not, per se, get schizophrenia, but right. part of your family, that it could happen. Right. And then I also thought they only have, what I know it happened to women, too, but, like, more male, whatever. Men, men can get schizophrenia. Yes. Have schizophrenia. That's a that's a good that's good. I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of times doctors will start diagnosing men or boys or young men mm -hmm. with schizophrenia at the age of 18. Mm -hmm. And so when you when they reach the age of 18 and they're demonstrating um, symptoms of schizophrenia, then they can get a true diagnosis. A lot of times, some doctors or pediatricians like to diagnose, uh, and these are medical doctors, like to diagnose children when they're younger, boys when they're younger with schizophrenia. But I feel like it's not true because they're not, they haven't reached a peak in their life to where they can start showing these signs and symptoms that this is what they really have. So when they're 18 or over, that's usually when the diagnosis age starts with schizophrenia. For women, it's usually 21 or over. Sometimes they do eight, try to do 18. And if you have a medical doctor that's trying to um, uh, label you with schizophrenia or diagnose you with schizophrenia, I suggest that you go to a psychiatrist and let the psychiatrist diagnose you, which they have studied mental illnesses for many years. Medical doctors have studied medicine for many years. And they're not as equipped, even when they when they prescribe psychotropic drugs for you if you have a mental disorder. They do what I call surface drugs, and those are the more common ones. But if you really want a good diagnosis and get on the right medication, a psychiatrist is who I would recommend that you go to. That's a very good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Yes, ma'am. I have a question too. When you were talking about um, bipolar, and you said that the manic stage, um, and you said don't like mess with them because you can aggravate them and make it worse. So, what do you do like if you come in contact with someone that is in that manic phase, and you want to keep them safe, or you know, what should you do? The best thing to do is to get them to the emergency room okay. as soon as you can. Um, Sometimes it may be a little challenging, but don't give up. Get them to the emergency room as soon as possible because somebody there will be able to recognize the behavior and will be able to know what to do, okay? Because it's a lot for a lay person that's not in the medical field uh, to know what to do. And we don't want anyone to um, have any additional negative responses to um, being manic and not knowing what to do. And the other side of bipolar disorder, which I didn't mention, was the depressive side. And it is a, a really heightened depression. When, because those are the two sides of, of, of bipolar disorder, mania and depression, okay? Good questions. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so growing up, I always heard that. Okay, you got to speak up a little louder. My ears are big. I'm up, pretty hearted, but sometimes I can't hear. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so growing up, we was always told that um, it's demonic. So is there some kind of demonic type of mental illness? Now you're asking somebody didn't say for like <laughs> over 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, I think when something is not treated properly, and it's let it's 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 gone for years and not been treated. Yeah. It could turn into something else. Yeah. That's what I believe. Yeah. Okay. And as an apostolic believer, it could turn into something else, and we can label it demonic. 
Okay. But even with that being said, I do believe God can heal that person. Yeah. If they want to be healed. And I do believe there's going to take a little bit more for that person to be healed. But yeah, that's what can happen when mental illnesses go untreated for years at a time. Good question. Yes, ma'am. Sister Lisa, I have another question. <laughs> so, in the world we're in today, and kids are into different types of drugs and stuff, do you believe that that can cause? Bipolar, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Like I said, you don't have to be born with it because God doesn't make mistakes. But those are factors yes. that contribute to people having mental health disorder. Because we see so many people come into hospital that has overdosed, and you ask, well, what did you take? And we give them a urinary, a, a, a drug screen, and it doesn't come up with anything. It's inconclusive because. It doesn't know what to recognize. It doesn't recognize anything. Mm -hmm. Because if you spoke a blunt, a blunt, mm -hmm. it's not a regular blunt. It's probably laced with formaldehyde. It's probably laced with um, fentanyl. And so you're not going to get an accurate reading when you do a urinary, uh, when you're a drug screen, because we don't know what they've taken. And they don't know. A lot of what I've been smoking with my buddy from, you know, for this many years. I said, well, do you owe him any money? Well, I might owe them a little bit. I'm like, okay, bingo. They let you know you still owe them. Mm. So when you smoke this blunt, you're a part of the blunt. This is what happened to you. So you better go pay him mm. and, or, and stop smoking with it. <laughs> okay. Because they were taking bitten on and put it on people's door handles of their cars. So when you touch the door handle and your skin made contact, you froze. Mm. And then that person watched you and they could come up and rob you. Then all of a sudden you are back to your regular mind and wondering, what, just, what happened? Why am I just standing here? I haven't gotten in my car and left. So yes, drugs are very powerful now. They mix every, any and everything with them. Meth smells so bad because everything is mixed with meth. And meth can make you feel like you are just completely going out of your mind. So that's a good point, very good point. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I've got a question. The whisperer. So, <laughs> how do, as parents, how do we recognize if it's a possible, like, signs of a mental struggle, mental illness in our children when they're just going through, like, adolescent, like, um, puberty and versus puberty and just, you know what I mean? Like, just growing pains. How can you tell the difference? If you are a child of God, God will let you know. If that person is on something, if that person has been hanging out with the wrong crowd, or if that person has a mental illness. I told you all, well, I didn't tell you yet, but before my son got saved, I anointed everything and prayed for him. Sometimes I wake up late, in, we are in the morning. I put oil in his shoe, blessed oil now, not just regular oil, oil that I had taken to church and the, and the pastors and all of them prayed over it. I put it in his shoes. I put it in his socks, I put it in his sock drawer, I put his underwear drawer, I put it in his, his because he had separate towels because he was young and he would, you know, smell stuff. Mm -hmm. So he had his own set of this and his own set of that. I put it all in there. I put it in the bowl that he ate cereal out of. I put it in his uh, place setting at the table. His silver, where everything he touched in the house, I anointed him. Because he was out there and I couldn't be with him 24 seven and he wasn't saved at the time. And one day I remember I put it on the door handle and he said, mom, what is this? This door feels slick, there's something on here. I said, it is. <laughs> I said, what you think that is? He said, I don't know. I said, well, it didn't bother me. Did it bother you? Your head still cramped or anything? He said, no, ma'am. I said, you all right, go on, you know. So God, if you if you have that relationship with God, mm -hmm. your prayer life is where it should be with God. He will show you, and all you have to do is ask Him. Lord, show me my child. Mm -hmm. Show me what He's doing. Show me what He shouldn't be doing. Show me why He's doing it, and give me the words to sit down and talk to Him about. It. Because you know when you talk to teenagers, honey. Especially boys, they don't give you money for their money because they have all the answers. And you've lived all these years, 
but they can tell you, and sometimes they can tell you what's going on out there in the show. <laughs> you know, and I do have an ear to listen to that. But sometimes they know everything. And my sister and I, we pray, I need to talk to so-and-so tonight, I need you to pray, girl. You know, yeah. and approach them with the right attitude because they have feelings too. And just because we're the parent, it doesn't mean we have to jump all over them. Right. You know, you have to mistreat them and talk to them like they're the wall. They don't have no feelings. Right. But you can get to anything, anybody, with the right attitude and the right tone of voice. I'm not saying be wimpy. No, I'm not a wimpy girl. But I know when it's time to be wimpy, well, to be soft spoken and to be a little bit more aggressive. Yeah. And sometimes with boys, you got to be a little bit more aggressive. You know, because he was standing over my head at 14 and said something small. And I said, Lord, let me jump up and slap him. <laughs> and my feet left the floor. And I jumped up and I gave him a left smack. And he said, well, where did that come from? I said, from the Lord. Do you want another one? <laughs> Don't you ever stand in my face, behind my back, outside this door, in your bedroom, anywhere and ever think you can talk to me like that. I will not have it. And I, I promise you this, when I get through with you, I will win because the Lord is on my side. And I never had that problem, ever again. But God will show you, talk to their friends. When he had, I never let him sleep away from home, but I let the friends come to my house. And I listen. I'd be walking through, oh, excuse me. <laughs> Boy, we're sitting in here playing these games. Excuse me. Listen. You know, I'm looking at expressions. I'm thinking, I'm seeing what these other children are talking about. Uh, give me some idea. And then I'm going to call their parents. I heard your son talking about this and so. What does that mean? Oh, I didn't know they would. Well, yeah. I just heard it. You know, so... Stay close and in tune to your children, Amen. all of us, Amen. okay? Amen. Even now that my son is grown, I won't tell you how old he is, because I'm so young. <laughs> but uh, even now, you know, I had to learn how to parent him as an adult. Yes. Because I couldn't treat him like I did when he was 14, you know, because he's not 14. And he's been married, he has two, I have two lovely grandchildren, daughters, and I couldn't, I had to find, I had to ask God to show me how to talk to him. I had to get in my textbooks and see how to parent an adult child because it's totally different, okay? But when they get saved and they're an adult child, it's totally different, you know? It's, it's totally, we can have conversations and not disagreements like that. We can actually sit down and have a conversation. So these are good questions. Okay, let's get through this. So a great commission, five warning signs of mental health. We talked about excessive paranoia, worry, or anxiety, long-lasting sadness or irritability, extreme changes in moods, social withdrawal, dramatic changes in eating or sleeping habits, and the contributing factors, we went over this, childhood abuse, trauma, neglect, so on and so forth. Okay. And these are some scriptures that God gave me for people who are experiencing any symptoms related to mental health. So you can write them down. Um, I didn't have time to get a copy for you, but um, you can take a picture with your camera phone, uh, but, but get these scriptures and get them under your belt. Read them, don't just take a picture of them, don't read them. And they're very encouraging, they're very uplifting. And you know, the word, it's just the words, you know, you got to take it at face value. It's just the word. Amen. And we have treatment options. Now, a lot of people say, you know, I don't want to go to therapy. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. So when you go to counseling, counseling can be like a, they, counselors often say that's a quick fix. They can give you a bunch of resources. They want to look at, um, you know, first of all, they want to look at, well, are you working? Do you have a job? And I don't know if that's because they want you to pay them or not. I don't know. 
Uh, but they, if they look at it as a quick fix, they don't have time to sit down and do psychotherapy, which is talk therapy. Uh, they want her to get you in and out. And that's, that's okay. If that works for you, that's good. I like therapy because therapists such as myself, we will ask a lot of questions, develop a treatment plan, develop um, different things to uh, have you do, talk, 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 until we come up with a solution that will help you to move forward. And that's the ultimate goal. You may find out that you opened up about this today when you didn't think that was important, but that helped to move you forward, okay? So psychotherapy, which is talk therapy, which therapists do, are um, therapy that I like to, to uh, use, okay? Because it will get to the root and the heart of the problem, whether are you going through a bereavement, whether you're going through a separation, divorce, loss of job, whatever it is, we need to sit down and have a conversation, okay? And also medication therapy like Pastor was talking about, I do believe in medication because sometimes we need medication. Sometimes medication and, and, and psychotherapy go together. And sometimes I may suggest, talk to your doctor, your medical doctor, or your psychiatrist, or maybe, maybe give, let me give you some resources for psychiatrists and talk to them and see what's the mildest medication that you could take that's gonna help you to put your chemical imbalance back into balance, okay? And I took medication for my depression when my mom died. I took medication and it helped me so much. These are my references that I use. And I wanna tell you about my story. So my mom was diagnosed with colon cancer in 1994. But she wouldn't go to the doctor. My mom did not like to go to the doctor. And we knew that about her. And as much as I prayed, the more she fought. But anyway, so then in 1996, she got really worse and she decided to go to the doctor. Well, according to the doctor's standards, it was too late, okay? If they had opened her up, she would have died on the table. Because the cancer had spread through her colon just that rapidly, or just that way over a period of time that it was at the point. So basically all they could do is make her comfortable. But she had the best doctors and she had the best nurses and she had, we had really good medical support. So she started reverting back into her childhood. And I started having to go work part time, be home with mom, take care of her. Wasn't gonna put her in a home or in a facility because that was my choice. Sometimes you don't have that choice. Sometimes you have to do what's best for your family or best for you, right? No right or wrong answer. It just depends on what works. I didn't want her to go to a facility. And after a while, I left my job full time and came home. So I was raising this child, taking care of my mom, but it was okay because that's what I wanted to do and God gave me strength every day to do that. So she, it finally came to a point to where she passed away and it just, devastated me. I'm the youngest and I was with her the shortest amount of time. So when I want to know something about her, I'll talk to my oldest sister who was with her longer than me. But I was really devastated and the only thing I could do is in the mornings, get up, fix my son breakfast, get him on to the school bus, take me a bath, go back to bed. I was asleep from the time he left to an right hour before he, I knew he was coming home. And then I would get a prepared dinner, a go out and buy dinner and have it there, talk to him, get homework, get him in, you know, situated for the next day, go back to bed. Did that for many, many months. And then I found out that we had a family friend who was a therapist and I started talking to him. And then he recommended another therapist to me and I started talking to that therapist. And I thought, hmm, okay. Never thought I'd be here, but I'm glad to know that I have these resources. And so I was in therapy probably for about a couple of years. And the depression got so bad that he recommended a psychiatrist that I could go to. And I started taking medication. 
Now, my system, I don't, can't take strong medicine. So if you give me a, and I have to take tablets because I can't swallow them. capsules, I'm, my throat is a child's throat. Mm -hmm. uh, but so he would give me these big horse peels that I'd have to cut in like three or four pieces and I'd take a piece, you know, mm -hmm. all through the day till I got one down. So I started taking the medication and then one day I had got back into bed thinking I was just gonna relax until it was my therapy time. And I had a girlfriend that had been friends. We taught school together for years. She called me and she said, what are you doing? I said, what is it of your What it is, what is it? Why are you asking me that? Whatever I said, something smart. And she said, because I know you in that bed. I said, Ann. And she said, it's time to get up. It's time to wipe your eyes. Come down here to the, to the daycare. She had retired from teaching school. She was running the daycare at the church. Come down here. I'm like, I no, I can't get in the car, I can't drive. I just she said, I'll send somebody to pick you up. I don't want to drive with nobody's car, ain't nobody with nobody out. Look, you be ready in one hour because if you're not, and they come back without you, it's gonna be a problem. I thought, hmm, she sounded kind of serious. I might be a little strong. So I got up, you know, put on something that went down there. She said, you're going to be my computer person. I'm like, I'm not really that proficient in computers. She said, well, you've got enough to, for these little preschool children. You can do enough for them to use the computer. I said, okay, I'll, I'll you know. She said, I'm going to give you a check every week. I'm like, oh, okay, now we're talking. <laughs> uh, so we negotiated. I said, now, you know, I'm not retired, so I still need a good salary. She said, what were you making late in the day? <laughs> I said, that's not your business. <laughs> you don't have anything to do with what I was doing in, in my bed or what I was making. It's not your business. She said, okay, you know I'm going to be fair. I said, I know. And so I stayed down there with her. And then it, it felt, it started, I started to feel a lot better. Okay. In my mind, I didn't feel so lonely in my heart. I didn't feel so disconnected. In my, in my spirit, and I well, I wasn't praying like I was before, but even the desire to pray more started coming back. So I knew it was time for me to take life back. And she was the one that God used to help me to get back on my feet. And to tell you the truth, I haven't looked back. And I thank God because it wasn't easy but I didn't exclude God. He still watched over me and I prayed as much as I could pray at that time, okay? It wasn't full blown, drawn out prayers like normal, but it was what I could do at that time. And it helped me to continue to know that God was there. And he even let me see my mom. And she came to me, now you know, back then we had entertainment centers, right? You have your television and the entertainment center. I did. It was nice. And my mom came and stood in the middle of the entertainment center, showing a beautiful white outfit. And I used to do her hair. I was a beautician. I used to do her hair. And she had her hair fixed up pretty. And I thought, whoa. And she said, she had big eyes. And she would fuck her eyes. And she said, everything's going to be all right. And that that's not all right, it's going to be all right too. And right then and there, it's like, you know how on the, what is that, ain't that show about the angel and it's, you hear this music, oh, you know, it seemed like I could hear that music and I just knew, I knew within my heart of hearts, that was my day of deliverance, you know, and I thank God for the experience. So now I uh, go through the house and I talk to her, not always kind of girl, now look. And she just called me, damn, girl, go somewhere and sit down. You know, and, and we were friends. We were mother and daughter. And we had a really good relationship. We were very close. We were the only two, after my grandmother died, that were in the church. So we was always going to church together. And so we had a really good relationship. And um, she was, was still protecting me. She knew how to raise uh, an adult child in me. And we just loved each other. We just, you know, she had a thought about something. When I get to work, she called me and say, I just want to make sure you got there all right. 
and now she does it. She'll send me a text. Just want to make sure you get to work okay. Didn't ask her to, but she knows I like that. Susan, I call and check on me. Are you okay? Send me some emojis. Sister LaShawn, she'll send me. I was thinking about you. Praise the good Lord. I was thinking about you. A lot of different people in my circle. The heavy hitters is who I call. You know, I was sick last week. And I wanted to fast today, but I knew that I was not, it was not uh, expedient for me to fast. And so I called, I text some of the heavy hitters, call some of the heavy hitters and said, pray. I have to do this this evening, so I need you to pray. And they did. I'm feeling good, sitting up here on that chair. But I thank God that he delivered me out of that situation that I was in, because if I had a kept going on, and she hadn't called me, and I hadn't got the therapy, and took the medication, and that worked for me. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to do that, but it worked for me. And God used that to deliver me. And so I used the empty chair, and I take the chair, one of my kitchen chairs, and I put it in my bedroom, on the side of my bed, and that represents my mom. So when I need to talk to her about something, I'll bring a chair in the room, and I'll sit on the side of the bed, and, she, and I'll face the chair, and I'll just pour my heart out. She doesn't say anything, she doesn't mm -hmm. but it helps me, yeah. and I call it the empty chair syndrome. Yeah. And so I use that, and on my porch, I got made sure that this house had a porch. She loves to sit on the porch, people waving at her, carrying on, and I put a chair out there for her. And so we sit out there in the mornings when I'm off and we have a, a cup of tea. She doesn't, but I do. And, you know, we talk. And we look over the neighborhood. And we pray through our neighborhood, you know. And so I thank God for that experience because had I not had that experience, something would have been missing that I'm able to talk to my uh, clients about that I provide therapy for. So I'm thankful for that. And I appreciate God for giving me that experience. And I know it sounds strange, but those of you that have, are walking with the Lord, you know what I'm talking about. You know, they get not strange that these fiery times will come. But God brought me through it. That's, the, that's what I want you to take away from this. Even though you may have uh, come in contact with a mental health disorder at some point in your life, you may be going through something now. Remember, God can bring you through, right? right? Stay prayed up, talk to people about it, go to therapy if that helps you. If you need a counselor that can just give you some quick stuff, do that. If you need some medication, take that, but just don't ignore it because it's not going to go away. It may get worse, like she was talking about with the schizophrenia. She was talking about with her, with the drugs <coughs> and the drugs. So that's my advice. You know, if you take nothing else from here, know that God can do anything but what? Yeah. Yeah. And all you have to do is talk to him about it. Yes, he knows what we're going through, but we, but he still wants to hear from us. And the way we talk to him is through our prayers. Amen. You know, I go through the house praying all the time. Sometimes I pray so that I fall asleep on my knees. And I'm like, Lord, forgive me, but you know, I'm down there a long time. But that's okay. Because he's gonna help us. Right? Right. And whatever you're dealing with, know that there's help out there for you. Like Pastor said, he didn't want to take the medicine. But when he realized that the medicine was gonna help him, prayed over it. Because, you know, medicines can have a lot of different side effects, especially if you take it more than one. Have different side effects, but if you pray over it and ask God to remove those side effects, I always look at the, the additional side effects when I look at the little pamphlets that they put in there. Because some of that stuff's like, am I going to be experiencing that? And I ask God, don't let me experience that. I don't know anything about that. And he will help you. Trust me and believe he helped me. And he loves me no more than he loves you. That's right. He's a just God, he's a faithful God, and he's a prayer answering God. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Sister Lisa, what do you have to say? I, I, 
I don't have a problem with therapy. What do you have to those people who do have a problem with therapy and they're like, oh, it's nothing. Well, how do you get them to want to talk to someone? Or feel like so, they need to talk to someone? Right, or they need to talk to someone. Like, that's a very good question. I sit down and I, I talk with them and I share my story with them. And I let them know I'm a therapist and been a therapist, been in this business over 30 years, so yeah. I know what works and what doesn't work. And if you just give it a chance, you know. And then I'll say, you and I have talked for like an hour. There was a therapy session. It's not going to be more intense than that unless you want it to be, you know. And if that doesn't work, tell them, you know what, I'm going to be praying. Because prayer changes things, right? Yeah. God will let them see and he'll change, let them change. So if you can't get to him by talking to him, then like I used to do with my son before he got saved, stop talking and start praying. Yeah. And that, that will change him. Trust me, I, I, I do that too. Okay? Sometimes I have some of the stubbornest people that I have to talk to, and I can say stubborn because I'm so stubborn sometimes, and I can use that word because it fits me. And before you know it, before that conversation is over, Run them over with God's help. That's how, that's how I do it, and that works. Any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, what do you say about um, midlife crisis? Like, where does that fit in with the mental disorders that you Ooh, yes. <laughs> So with midlife crisis, which of course I've come through that as a young person, mm -hmm. But we always go through menopause early. So in my 40s, I went through menopause. But sometimes um, when you go through menopause, it's a, it's, a, it's a whole different experience. And so um, you want to make sure that when you start feeling a certain kind of way, and you may have some of these experiences or feelings that I just talked about, you want to talk to your doctor. And I always urge women to have a woman OBGYN because they know what women go through. A man don't know what women go through. Okay. So talk to your OBGYN or talk to your female um, medical professional and let them know what you're going through. And they can put a, a label on it for you where they say you're going through midlife crisis, and you may need to, you know, do this, because I do therapy for that. Or you may have developed a mental health disorder, okay? But you want to start by talking with a medical professional and then go from there, okay? And before you go to that appointment, pray and ask God, Lord, you know what I need for her to tell me? You know what I need for her to talk to, what I need to talk to her about? I need her to be open and honest and tell me what I need to know and give me information about, because I'm a researcher, and I will research something until there's no more to research. Right. And let her, let her tell me what I need to know for me. That's what I recommend, because that's what I did. Of course, my mom was gone by then, but I went to my older sister, and also to Sister Williams, and they shared their experiences with me and I think I had one hot flash throughout the whole time. And it was, my body got so hot, I thought I was on fire. So I called it a fire flash. And after that, instead of getting hot flashes, I got cold chills. So when I would get cold chills, I'm like, why am I getting cold chills? I should be having hot flashes. And the doctor said, well, it's very rare, but some women do experience cold chills rather than hot flashes. So I really don't know what was worse. The hot flash I had, the fire flash, or the cold chills. Because I still have the cold chills. And it's been years. You know? So, yeah. Talk to your prayer about it and talk to your um, primary care physician. Okay? Yes, Pastor? Okay, I just got one question. Uh, kind of to help us as parents with adult children. I, I guess it would apply to all children, but um, kind of what 
can we look for, like, um, our family uh, years ago was impacted by suicide, right? Uh, my cousin. But he wasn't, uh, before I was, a, and I was a kid at the time, okay. or a teenager. Um, usually, back then, from my perspective, suicide was something that you would have to keep eye on your teenagers when they're going through puberty and things like that. A parent, we know, okay, let, you know, they look vulnerable, we know to watch, right? right? But as I've grown older and become a parent, I have two adult children and one teenager. Uh, I'm finding out, you know, just from knowing people and then looking back at what happened in my own family, that even as young adults, as adults, uh, you made a statement a, a, a minute ago, your mother knew how to mother the child that was in you, even when you were a, a young adult. Exactly. Uh, what can we do as parents, even with grown children, uh, what are some of the things that we want to be there? No, no parent wants to wake up, find their child, right. you know, and think, what could I have done different? I know it's probably not a perfect answer to this because right. we would all know it. Um, what can we do to stay in tune with our children, if you have an answer, um, to where they know that even as an adult, man, this door is open? Um, and you, you're not by yourself. You may feel lonely right, right, right. amongst your peer group, right. and I understand that. Right. But as long as I'm here, you're not utterly alone. As long as God is in your life, you're not utterly alone. What can we do to assure that we're giving our children that message? Very good question. Very good question. Suicide rate in Adolescents, young adults, and middle-aged adults have risen by 25% within the last three years, I believe. And it's going up, it's getting higher. And so I'm glad you brought that up. We see so many attempted suicides that come into the hospital where they are like, I just can't do it anymore. I can't move past this. I got unstuck. My thing is, of course, prayer, okay? Pray that God will allow you to, learn, to, to teach you how to talk to that adult or that teenager. Because a lot of times adult, uh, teenagers and some young adults won't talk to us as parents, but find somebody that they trust that they'll open up to. Yes. And let that person that you find for them tell them they're not going to tell me verbatim what's going on with you, but I want to build this support system around you so you will know that you can talk to this one, this one, this one, this one. But if they feel like there's something that I should know, they're going to tell me. Are you okay with that? Okay? Because a lot of times they won't talk to us. We have to ask God how to talk to them, how to communicate with them, how to get them to open up because they'll talk to their friends and their friends don't have much experience and much more experience than they do, but they're there for them. They're like right now, right now friends, they're right there for them. And I talked to two young ladies that are just beautiful young ladies and they're, they've been there for each other, helping each other to get through what they need to get through. And talking to me, they pulled me in so it was a, and then they had family that they could pull in. And these girls are doing, they're, they're wonderful. I just love them. I mean, they're just like my own. But that is what I would recommend. Talking, talking, talking. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Because anything that you ask God for, he's going to do it. And he's, he's, he's going to, if you're sincere and you go to him, he's going to answer those prayers. Trust me. I have Read my pillow some nights when my son was out there before he got saved. I said, I was going to stop using that word. Everybody saved. Before he got filled with the Holy Ghost. And everybody don't have that. The good Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. uh, and before he got I would read my pillow because I was concerned about where is my child? What's he doing? Then when I found out he was carrying a gun, oh, father. You know? But guns are, are, are easy to get to nowadays. Um, and there's so much out there that is enticing to our children. So find a way to talk to them. 
Ask God to guide you, to lead you, to put you in touch with people who they're in touch with, to give them an out or a person that they can talk to you if they don't want to talk to you as the parent. But still stay tuned, in tune, to what that person is going through. Okay? I love you. I'm here for you. I want the best for you. It may not, you know, you may not see that you're doing well, but you are. I'm proud of you. You know, you are making me so happy that you're in my life. You know, quote scriptures to them. Let them know I'm here for you. And when my son came by just to give me a hug and a kiss, look up on my face in this text, do you know how that made me feel? Wow, I was like, shh. President Biden don't have anything on me. Okay? So, yeah, that's what I do, did and do. And that's what I recommend. Because all the book knowledge that I had, and I have a lot, sometimes my head be like, whoo, let me close this book up and I can't, can't absorb anymore. Because I'm looking for something, a solution or something. And some people like book stuff, you know? I love, I love books. I got books everywhere. But um, sometimes you just have to put the book down and pick up and get on your knees. That's right. Okay. Even if you're walking and praying, you're still talking to God. God is still going to lead and guide you into all truth and give you ways to help your child. Right. He's not going to turn a deaf ear to you. Amen. But that's what I recommend. Okay. Man. Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to thank you for coming. This is really, really helpful. Um, <clears throat> uh oh, we got another whisperer. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I just want to thank you for coming. This is really, really helpful. Oh, thank you. But, uh, thank you for inviting me, Pastor yes. and First Lady and all the church. Thank you. <laughs> so, mine is not necessarily so much a question or it might turn into a question, but really what I wanted to, to point out is you know, as a, the, a saint, right? I've been saying for almost 23 years, and it can be a lot of times when we're going through things, mm -hmm. there's this shame that comes with us. And a lot of times that can hinder us from, from reaching out for help. But as we mature in God, and you know, we understand the scripture, our relationships develop God, um, and not just quality scripture, but starting to write, we divide the word of God. That's right. It's in there, you know, yeah. to, to get help, yeah. right? And so, you know, I think about the scripture, for example, there's a, I think it says safety and a, a multitude of counselors. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll take that scripture and apply it to business or apply it to education, but not, I can't apply it to my mental health. I mean, that, that ain't, that's all, you know. Yeah. So what God wants us to be healthy mentally, spiritually, and now. That's right. That's right. And so I can, when I first met you, thinking back a couple of you know, years back when my mom passed, you know, totally unexpected. The level of grief, there is, there are no words. Right. right. And then to be uh, propelled into another level of grief within six months. Yeah. You know, a test on top of a test. Uh, there's no way I could have got, gotten through that without getting some help. Right. Yeah. And so I'm a praying woman, I'm a fasting woman. You sure? All of that, right? You pray for me. But yeah. I needed help. I needed help. And so the shame, you know, we we have to allow God to help us. You gotta love yourself enough That's to, right. to say, no matter who's gonna judge or who's talking, a lot of times the enemy's whispering, ain't nobody even thinking right. that. But if they are, do I love myself enough to get the help that I need? Because Come at on. the end of the day, nobody's gonna take care of you like you. That's That's right. Right. You know what I mean? And if you, you, well, we're so embarrassed to get the help we need, and, and knowing that you're losing your mind. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like, or, or you're falling into you're, you're moving out of just grief. Now it's turning into to deep depression, right? right. Uh, don't You have to reach out and get help. And so I thank God for him helping me to humble myself and get the help that I need right. um, right. for that season of my life right. to get me where I am now. Yes. My mother wouldn't have wanted it any other way. Right. You know what I mean? Um, and again, all the things that happened on top of that, yeah. there's some things you need help. Yes. You need help. Yes. Whether it's something chemically going on in your body or just life. Life is that you know the slow saying now, life be life. Yeah. And both. You know, just yeah. like 
it's sometimes it's too much. You have to get some help. So I just want to share, you know, a portion of that testimony to encourage people to not allow shame, the whisper, the enemy, or even people. And sometimes people mean well. Yeah. But I have to do what's going to be best for, for me. you. Right. Maybe right. you don't got to do that, but I got to do what's best for me. Right. And in this case, if I need to talk to someone or whatever it might be for your situation, please get the help you need. Yes. Yes. I don't want to raise my children. Right. Yes. My girls have the Holy Ghost. They're safe. But I don't, they, I don't know what's going to come down the road for right. them. I don't want them to. I don't want to raise my daughters where... Um, they feel like they can't get help if they need it. Right. Most especially as we see the suicide rates yes. increasing. Yeah. We see it even in the church. Yeah. Yeah. Even oh, yeah. in the church. Oh, so yeah. we have to really teach them that it's okay to get help. It's okay if you're not feeling like yourself. It's okay, you know, um, to talk to someone or to come and say you need some help. Instead of letting them, who wants to, the next thing you know, you find your child, they ain't here. No, no remove the shame. And let them know you're human. Right. And it's enough word to back it. That's right. Yeah. Jesus wouldn't have had to come and do all the miracles he had to do. All of it wasn't because just sin. Right. Yeah. There were things going on where people needed help. So I just want to be a better steward over the people that God has given me access to. Right. To first of all to overcome the shame. And not only that, sometimes it's pride. Like you have to lay your That's pride it. down. That's it. Because who wants to go through, you know, and then you just on blast. Yeah. So lay, humble yourself on down. Come on now. And help somebody. Help somebody. To know that if you got through it, they can get through it. Because everybody can't get through every storm. No. And they need to know that with some help, or even if it's a friend, whatever, mm -hmm. is going to work for them, that you can get through it. But we, people need to hear the testimony. Yes. And if we hide it, and we ashamed, and we embarrassed, and we might feel all of that, but let God use you still. That's yes. still Him using us. Right. That's right. And I want to be used, even with the thing that cost me the most. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So I just wanted to share it. Thank you for that. Yeah. 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 Before, well, before fall. fall. So sometimes you have to have that tunnel vision where that blocks out whatever people are saying that's negative about you. Ask God to give you that much more stamina to stand up and to declare, regardless of what they say, this is what I'm going to do for me. And give me tunnel vision. Like the, like the horses, you know, when they put those things on the side of the horse, they can't see on the left, right, they can't see on the left, they can only see what's ahead of them. And ask God to help you to get, give you some tunnel vision if that's what you need to get to the point of where you're going to ask for some help. Because help is out there, and that's why he gave me this mission, to take mental health into the apostolic churches. And I want you all to pray for me from this day forward. There are more apostolic churches reach out and say, come talk to us. Because this is what we need. A lot of churches have stopped having testimony services to a morning service. Because they want to get everybody out so you come back. But I enjoy sitting there listening to Sister Watermelon tell me about what happened to her when she, whatever. You know, I enjoy those testimonies. And because of COVID, not a lot of churches have evening services. And we still don't know what's going on with nobody. But, like she said, we got to swallow our pride. We got to ask for help. We got to be concerned about not just the circle of people that we deal with, but anybody that's in that outer circle. Bring them into that inner circle so they can get the help that they need. And talk to them. I tell anybody, yes, I went to therapy and it was the best decision that God helped me to make. Yes. Took the medication, it was the best decision God helped me to make. Yeah. You know, went through my major depressive disorder. He brought me through it, he can bring you through it. Okay. Everybody in here. Yeah. Because even now sometimes I get sad because I miss my mother. I want her to be here with me. You know, I know she can. And I told her, I said, Say, you'll be okay until I get there. Because when I get there, we're going to have to 
catch up on some stuff. But even in that, somebody will call, somebody, I'll see something on television, I'll see something in the Bible that I'm reading that will draw my mind up out of that situation. So yes, please, if it means tunnel vision, use tunnel vision. But please, 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 I can't, I can't specify it enough. Get the help that you need because there's help out there. And if I can be of any help to help you help yourself, uh, please call. Please call. Pastor and First Lady have my number. Uh, the Anchors family, they have my number. Uh, Sister LaShawn, she's got my number. So there's your resources right there, you know? You got my number. <laughs> Any more questions, comments? I hope I have it. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have one, just one comment. Um, this class has is, is, is helped me not just for people who are dealing with mental health, but people who are supporting people with mental health. And that is kind of where I just learned because, you know, a little about me, I'm a very encouraging person. So when that person is going through a state, I'm just really ready to encourage, encourage, encourage. But I just kind of learned over time that's not the type of help that they need for that for that time period. Yes. So as a support system, I've learned how to be patient while being still being supportive. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, that's just kind of where I've learned you know, to adapt and just show more empathy as well as sympathy, yes, yes. you know, because not because I deal with it, but because the person I love dealt with a situation and then I was part of that support team just to kind of help that person come out of it. Yes. And I have seen God just do miracles. Ooh, I have seen God just yes. turn, glory. you know, by being patient. My father-in-law told me a statement. He said, be patient for the payoff. And I, and, I, and I grabbed a hold of that. I grabbed a hold of that because now I see where patience and God's love and deliverance, you know, through, you know, prayer and fasting. And then sometimes we can do all those things, but we still have to be patient for God to move right. in our situation. Right. So I just love this class. I love what you're saying. Um, not just for the ones who are dealing with but the ones, the ones that are going to be in that part of that support team as yes, well. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to appreciate that. Uh, you're right. The support system has to be in place. Right. You have to develop it some kind of way. Somebody has to be the first one that says, we need to be there for that person. We need to understand. We need to be patient. We need to wait on God. God doesn't always answer today. Yeah. Right. But if we're, if we're willing to wait on him, mm -hmm. it will happen. Mm -hmm. and, just, and look at your situation. Yeah. Like you said, you were patient. And now your situation has moved on to the other side. Up, so yeah. look at God. Yes. Look at how God has oh, came God. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I, yeah, I know the time is going, but I just want to say this, make this statement that I think is a simple statement, but it's so important that we have to understand that the person that is going through that mental health or whatever they're going through, they don't want to go through it. Right. No right. more than we want to go through any True. sickness that yeah. we have. Yeah. They don't want to go through that. And, right. and and like the sicknesses that we can deal we can deal sometimes yeah. deal with, yeah. they can't control a lot right. of that. Come on, sis. They don't Come know what's wrong. They don't know what happened. Sometimes we don't know the trigger mm -hmm. and whatnot. And they and if and mental health and physical health they they together mm -hmm. but almost to a different extreme right. you know when it comes right. to mental health but I think I think that's important so yes. that's when we can be patient you know yes. we can be patient when we understand they don't want that that's right. right they don't that's want right. to deal they with that depression no matter what the mental right. health is you don't right. want to deal with that and what we're doing tonight and what's going to go forward yeah. I think it's going to help because yes. we're going to have more and more conversations in the church and yeah. even among ourselves and our family yeah. Yeah. and you get the stigma out of the way I have a testimony too because All right. back in uh, it started like in 2012 2013 I was going through a divorce and I had been married for 43 years. Ooh. 
And uh, I thought I was going to be married to this man for the rest of my life. Right. And uh, I was devastated. And I didn't know, how, and back then I wasn't saved. And so I didn't know how I was going to get through it, you know. And I, you know, I, you know, I just, I was really depressed. I was in a depression. And uh, my daughter, which, which is uh, Sh uh, Sh Shalia Akers, that's my daughter, oh, and okay. Pastor Akers, my son-in-law. Oh. They had, they had always been praying for me and my husband anyway to get into church and get saved. But you know, they they prayed and prayed and prayed, but we never did. But anyway, when I went through this divorce after 43 years, you know, I was just like lost because I was like, you know, I felt like I didn't have anybody, you know, and I was, you know, and it was it was bad because really I had God, but I did I, I didn't realize that, you know, I didn't put God first in my life, right. and so anyway. You know, I started, when, when they opened up their church, you know, they started having services. They started in their house at first. And then I, I started going. And it started making me feel better because I was at the point, you know, at first I thought, oh, I'm going to start, you know, I thought, well, you know, I'm single now. I'm going to start going out and, you know, partying every day. I can do this and that. But I wasn't happy. And so I just said, I said, I'm going to start going my, this to my daughter. I'm going to go to church and see you know, see what God can do for me because I, you know, I went to church when I was younger, mm -hmm. but you know, I kind of got away from it. And so anyway, I started, you know, started going to church, and I was, and I started feeling better. I said, boy, you know, I, you know, I started praying. I said, God is really helping me through this because I was thinking like I, you know, I, you know, after being married for all that time, I didn't feel like I could make it. Mm -hmm. But after I started going to church and I'm praying. And I was just, I felt, I felt so much better. I was relieved. I mean, it was like a weight lifted up off of me. And so, you know, I kept on, you know, kept on. And, well, right away, Pastor, you know, they, they, they took me to church. They, well, we didn't have our church here again, so they took me uh, to another church, and I got baptized Ooh. in Jesus' name. All right, now. And so, you know, now at first I was thinking like, what do you think? We get baptized said I said, well, wait a minute, you know, I feel like we all carry me fast now. But I got I think it's like, yeah, maybe yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and get baptized, you know, because I feel like I was ready. And so I went on and got baptized and then I started seeing the Holy Ghost, and I, you know, and so in twenty fourteen my divorce was final and I got saved, and I got the Holy Ghost that same year. Whoa. And I was like, God is really doing something really, else. Really working miracles in my life. And I was feeling like this is, you know, I feel so good, you know. And so anyway, uh, but see, God, and then also God was kind of preparing me too, because like uh, back in 20, right after COVID, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Jesus. And so I was, you know, I was like, now, now what? Is this is here comes something else. But see, I had that faith in God that whatever, right. whatever I was going through, He was gonna bring me through that. All right, now, sis. So I'm just thankful for God for what He has done in my yeah. life. And you know, because. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be sitting here telling the story because yes. I'm telling where I would be. You know, so I'm just thankful and I'm, you know, and I'm thankful for my for my daughter and, and my son-in-law and just all my, my church family because yes. they have helped me so much. Yes. And I think and, and it's and that's why it is so important to have people like that in your life. Yes. Right. Because right. they can help you you know deal with that along right. with you because know, God's gonna do it. Yeah. But they but just the have them there. That's right. right. Because God put these people in your life yes. for that. Right. So I'm just so thankful and I'm just happy to tell that story because yes. Yes. you know I'm cancer free now. I was well, no. oh. <laughs> so, you know and I'm like you know, um and I never did I always had faith. Yeah. And my cousin said one thing to me that made me feel so good. She said, you know what? You are, you are, care, she, what was that word? She said, you are sh uh, showing your faith out loud. Or something she said, she could tell me, because the way I always talk positive. Mm -hmm. I never said nothing negative about the cancer because I knew that whatever it was going to be, it was going to be because it's going to be God's will. Yeah. So that, and I was thankful for that. Yeah. And so I'm thankful to sit here today and say, God, saved me yeah, and right. he walked me through all right. of what I went through Come on. and it wasn't for him I couldn't have made it yes. and so I'm yes. thankful yes. to tell that story today because God is good yes man yes. 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 yes.
different situation. Yes, he did. Yeah. He happened that same year and gave you a reason to celebrate. That's right. right. When well, my mom died in May of 20... 1997. 1997, thank you. Mm -hmm. He let me close on the current house I'm living in in May 13 mm -hmm. of 2015. So he turned that negative into a positive. And now when I celebrate that day, yeah. I'm celebrating. And when you celebrate your day, yeah. you got the Holy Ghost, yeah. and he healed you of cancer. Yeah. Come on now. Because that's what he's talking about, that support system, yeah. that being patient, that, that, that your family was patient with you. They were understanding, you know. And just like Sister LaShawn said, Nobody wants to have a mental health disorder. No. Nobody wants to go through that. Right. But you go through it, and God helps you through it, yeah. so you can help somebody else. Right. You have to have the testimony That's that God right. did it for you, he did it for me. He's not a respected person. He's going to for you, too. That's right. And I thank God. You guys are making me feel so good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for allowing me to come. Thank you for welcoming me. Thank you for let, helping me to um, express what I needed to express through the Holy Ghost and not feel um, apprehensive or, you know, you guys were so open and receiving and just, just so, so welcoming. Amen. And I thank you for that. And God bless you all. May you have a safe journey home. Yes. And uh, again, to Pastor and First Lady uh, Akers and all the church, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I've enjoyed it probably more than you or as much as you. And I thank you for all, of, <laughs> excuse me, all your comments, all your questions, all of your testimonies, everything. I take them and I keep them here. And I appreciate you all. Appreciate you all. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.